Iron Will Tribe. It's a pleasure to be with you today and to connect with this gentleman, Danny Saggers, who's a powerful soul, who's got a lot of knowledge and experience and is doing some important work in this world that I want to highlight. And um, in today's podcast, we're going to explore Danny. Danny's a lot of things. He's a life coach, healer, facilitator, leads a multitude of projects which are heart-centered, transformative, and he's bringing a wealth experience, blending ancient tools that have been used since time immemorial with a transformative power of the group, of adventure, of nature, and of course, his own unique energy, which is significant anyone who's met him in person. I mean, I only met him once, but it was enough to leave a lasting impression that I've followed him since. Thank you for coming on my podcast, Danny. I do appreciate it. Thank you for the invite, brother. Yeah, great to be here. Danny, I want to start this off by understanding how you came up and going back in your personal history and taking us back to the early days for you. My question uh, to kick us off is around your earlier life starting off in Essex, as I recall which is not too far from where I used to live. I used to live in Battersea, Southwest. So we're from a similar sort of part of the world. For you, bud, I'm curious to know about this backdrop for your life because it paints a picture and it allows us to understand the human who's here today. Could you sure. talk, talk to us about the younger Danny? Danny at 18. How Let's start he... at the beginning, when I come through. So yeah. let's do it. Born and bred from Essex, which is close to London, if anyone doesn't know it, in the UK. And kind of bog standard family in the sense of normality, you know, football, fish and chips, Sunday dinners, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, my younger life as a child was very enjoyable, uh, always uh, very smiley and just like a curious, pure young soul. Uh, I used to love nature. I had a, a great grandfather in my life that I used to go into his house it was like an adventure playground going in his garden I used to be obsessed with frogs <laughs> always catching frogs which it funny how it leads into like the work with the camera and everything later in life I was always obsessed with weird things like I had like crystals and I was obsessed with ancient Egypt and the cactuses and the paranormal and like all these strange little nuanced interests as a kid it's interesting how they've come back in in later life on the path that I'm on, the cactuses of plant medicines. I'm going to Egypt this September on an incredible uh, voyage of discovery. Uh, you know, got back into the crystals with the medicine and the frogs, the cambo, we'll get onto that. It's a big part of my life now. So as a child, young, happy, good upbringing, the challenging time came for me in my teenage years. So from around the age of 11 is when it started hitting the reality maybe of being a young young ad not adult a young boy but coming into those teenage years i remember one time going out and just getting punched by someone for nothing really shocked me and was like well, what the fuck was that for because it was for nothing and that was i would say the beginning of uh, a chapter of intense violence because when that happened i remember i used to think i was tough and then when that person did that, that had a bit of a name in our area, I noticed how I shit myself and didn't know what to do. So that led me to start boxing the next week. So I'm super grateful to that person. That, thank you for that lesson. Started boxing and that changed the game for me. Uh, it really taught me how to defend myself. It taught me a lot of discipline. Um, yeah, it taught me so much, but also things started to shift where I was getting into a lot of trouble in my life. Like I, I decided I'm never having that situation happen again. I'm never taking any shit from anyone. Uh, and in the area that I grew up, it was very much dog eat dog, shall we say. You either like took it or you said, no, I ain't having it. And I weren't having it. So I ended up in a lot, a lot of street fights, very violent. Like I'm glad that it never came to the the point of like stabbing and things like that. But in terms of physical violence, it, it was full on. 
Uh, and that was like a 10 year period. All of my teenage years were like every weekend, almost like very intense street fights. So that was tough. Uh, I think at the time I didn't really acknowledge it for what it was like quite traumatic uh, and intense and used to kind of laugh it off and bu buzz off the adrenaline actually. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a lot. And then it was from there, I, at the age of 18, I left college. I went into investment banking. I don't ask me how I got into that. I just got given a chance, yeah? I didn't go to university or anything. I was smart. I still am. But I, did, I was not like someone that was academic that wanted to be studying. So I went into the city, started working in investment banking. And I remember I, I was there for around a year. And I just looked around and I said, this is not what I've signed up for. Like, this is not the life that I'm going to live. I knew that at that age and i remember back then there was this god rest his soul like there was this guy that was there and he was about to retire and he'd been at the company for 20 years i remember one day coming in and they were like yeah he's dead oh we need to start interviewing for someone else you know and that's the reality of working in a, a corporate environment people are numbers and i was just like yeah i've got to get out of here so at the age of 20 I came to do my first summer season in Ibiza and that was bred out of pure desire for hedonism. I remember I used to watch a show on ITV every night after my day at work and it was called Club Reps. And I'd see all these young people having so much fun, they're drinking, they're partying, they're making out, they're doing all these things. I'm 20 years, I'm, not, I'm 38 now, I'm 20 then. I'm like, fuck yeah, that's, that's what I wanna do. So made the decision came out to the Ibiza, super divine intervention part of my life. Cause I nearly went to Greece and someone that I knew just said, no, you should come to Ibiza, come and try that. I was like, sure. Uh, it would have been a different outcome if I'd have gone to Greece or, or come here. Greece would have been more fighting, drugs, alcohol. When I say drugs, we'll move on to, there's a lot of drugs out here, but it, cocaine and like all the kind of violence I think would have continued and who knows where it would have led. We're coming here. There's, much more love, much more open energy. There's MDMA, there's clubs. So it's not like fuck or fight at the end of the night. It's more expansive, you know? So there's a little bit about my background and uh, yeah, what kind of first got me out of the UK and onto a different path. Yeah, that's, I expected you'd um, lead into that because I think that's looking at you and also different things that you've shared. I remember this and it did stand out because I think environments like the UK, you know, they are what they are. Okay. They just are what they are. Um, I was also around a significant amount of violence when I was coming up. Right. Um, and definitely some of it was traumatic. Definitely some of it just, I think I responded to it in certain ways and developed a lot of like fear and insecurity. I think that's what it did to me. Um, and I kind of compensated for that by being just really good with people and um, having a lot of friends, having a ton of people around me and stuff like that. Um, and frankly speaking, that at some points was a really good thing because those people were actually really great people and supported me a lot in my life and have pushed me for three decades. And some ways it was not a good thing because of the wounding and some of the like Parts of my core and my own masculinity and strength, which didn't get developed because I was not willing to you know, confront things and confront parts of my being. Okay. Um, but those experiences are for that, there for us to grow ultimately. And we have to, at a certain point, get up and face reality and go with our gut instincts. And for you, as it was with me too, one of the first things we do is start to get out and move and see different things. What I love about what you said there was that you saw community and connection and love. You know what I mean? Like, that was, there wasn't a whole lot. I'm, I'm laughing because I'm also uh, slightly, uh, you know, a bit bitter about it, but there just wasn't a whole lot of that love what, what I saw um, growing up in my journey. I, I always say, like, we're a product of our environment. You know, whatever energy we're marinating in, we're going to, like, become to a certain level. And growing up in Essex, where I was, it was very... I can't speak for everyone there, but the people that I was interacting with and surrounded by, it's very kind of small mindset, closed-minded. There's a lot of um, 
you know, negative habitual patterns that are ingrained genera generationally in the people. And it's just, yeah, it's not, it doesn't provide a nice environment to grow up in. At least for me, it doesn't foster like love and ambition and all of these positive things that the other places that I've lived have brought out naturally and easily, almost effortlessly. So that's the thing, isn't it? You, you're drawn to go to Ibiza and in particular, what sparks your imagination <clears throat> is, is seeing the, the party scene, seeing community, seeing people having a lot of fun. And you see that there's a different scene here, which is one that you start to embed yourself in. So I understand that part of your passion is for music. So you have a real significant passion for that, right? You're a DJ, you've got a depth of connection and you can see- And a rapper. Brilliant. We can do one at the end if you like to wrap up the podcast. Yeah, that'd be beautiful. I'd appreciate that. Talk to us about when you land in Ibiza and you're now going to be a rep. You're surrounded by techno scene, house music, raves, love, all of this. I want to know what was it that drew you in and I want to know how did it affect you and your mind and your being? Okay, so yeah, a little background on my journey with music before landing in Ibiza. Like from the youngest, youngest age, I remember the radio being on at home or in the car and certain music would come on. I'd just be like this. From the youngest age, I was like, I fucking love this, which I then later on found out is like electronic music. So varying like genres, but I just latched onto electronic music from a very early age. And then there was the whole like garage scene that we had in the UK and then grime come in and at, at school it was all garage. And so I started, I loved the MCs and everything. So I started writing lyrics and then I started like getting better at that. I remember entering a competition on the radio and I won it. It was called MC Idol and I won out all these MCs that went on there. And so I was really into my music before going to Ibiza. And the first times I started going out in the UK to clubs, I remember the first time I did a pill and, you know, being immersed in this different music. And it was almost like on nights out, I evolved in my musical taste. I went from not liking house music to like going into really liking Fungi House. And then when I first arrived to Ibiza, that's what I liked is like, I like Fungi House. I don't know about this other, the house and techno. But upon arriving and then having these nights out, there was such an incredible scene. And it, drugs are a part of it. You know, I'm not going to I doubt that uh, they were quite a big part of it and they could be the make or no, not sorry, not the make or break. They broke a lot of people out because they didn't know how to find balance, but they can also really open the mind in certain ways, you know, they to varying degrees. There's like maybe some levels of benefit, something like MDMA, and then there's detriment as well that can come. So I've arrived, this young chavy from Essex, I've went to an interview for a a job for one of the clubs Eden out here and out, there was hundreds of people but anyway I got chosen to be on the team of say 10 and I fucking loved it bro I worked six nights a week for nothing for fuck all you know but I loved it so much we was on a commission basis I was always winning the bonuses I was getting the most people through the doors I was like learning how to communicate with people, have people skills, like, talking to all these uh, really beautiful women and it's learning to understand like, oh, actually, like this, I can chat to these and I'm telling that they're enjoying my energy. And so that I've opened up new dynamics on that level. Um, one of the biggest things, I always remember this, is I, I've, I literally used to walk around, walk around with my fists clenched mm. because I was so on edge in the UK. I would, I would get into fights, bro, just in the middle of the high street, in the middle of the day with people that I had issues with. So I come here and it was like this exhalation of relief of like, oh, people are friendly here. People just want to be mates and want to do nice things and have fun. And so that energy, you know, started dissipating out of my being and I started relaxing. And I still got the few first years out here, I got into a, so a couple of situations and altercations because it was still a little bit in me, you know, but uh, time brings the wisdom, brings the maturity, brings the calmness. Um, but yeah, I really became just totally immersed in the dance music scene here. I was obsessed 
with uh, minimal techno. That's like the, the sound that was really in there. And there was electro house, which was the more commercial stuff, like put your hands up for Detroit and tunes like that, that that were around. And it was a really cool scene and it was amazing. All the workers out here, uh, all these young people from all around the UK working in the bars and clubs. And we would go out together to the bars after work. We would go to the clubs. The other night I was driving past this swingers club here in Ibiza with a friend. And I went, this place here, I remember going there when I was 20, like as a, a youngster out here after work. And just that was a funny story. I was like, I've got to write that story down in the book when I write it with, with some of the others. Um, but yeah, it was just this magical experience and really like community as well. Seeing my friends on the daily when I'm working and getting to interact with so much people, it's, that was amazing. Like tr so transformative coming from sitting in an office under fake lighting, you know, doing the most boring shit. To, to live in the life of my dreams, which then was, you know, being a PR and drinking and meeting women and having fun. I was, I was literally living my dream and it, it was so much fun. Um, so yeah, totally different environment. And Ibiza, as much as it is, you know, a hedonistic party centric island, it has such a strong energy and it has a really magical, transformative, powerful spiritual energy that even if someone doesn't have the awareness to understand it, just being within that radiance, just marinating within that will be transformative for someone. Mm. It's funny how like, it's almost like the energy of places sometimes where I think it's the condition of people and I think it's like when people can let go and not feel like they're under threat, they're more loving. I just think that's something. They can good. thrive. Yeah, we can thrive when we feel safe and when we feel loved. Yeah. And it's funny when we kind of reflect. I understand what you're talking about. You, you mentioned that in Essex, you'd find yourself walking around with your kind of fists clenched. That's kind of the energy that we get into, right? It's a different energy. It's like anger, aggression, hostility. It, it was it was just sorry it's just like an aggy environment and it's like we'll get on to the men's work that i do now but it's all these old-fashioned bullshit beliefs about masculinity of like yeah be the artist geezer and like yeah i can drink you under the table and like having an attitude and not taking any shit it's it's all these like unhealthy masculine bullshit values that, that were thrown about oh yeah sniffing it we will get a gram of goo and yeah with the boys you know it's fucking bullshit yeah. perfect it, it is it doesn't work for many of us either like i know for myself my relationships and whatnot and just how i was with people when i was in an environment where i was not able to like thrive and let go they just were not functioning i think it's difficult to grow when you've got certain insecurities and you're embodying certain ways of being certainly as a man that are just not you and are not authentic. People know it ain't you. Like if you're not acting with your most congruent part of your being, just talking to people. Certainly, I think women pick up on it a lot. Bro, a lot. energy don't lie. It's one of my favorite sayings. So I'm gonna get a tattoo some of me. Energy don't lie. Yeah, it's a transmission. More than the words that are coming out of anyone's mouth, the vibration that I'm receiving from them, my gut, what it's saying about them speaks volumes. Some people are faking it, you know, and other yeah. people you feel the genuine transmission of authenticity when they speak. Yeah. And that's what we are drawn to as people. And it's, it's difficult in this world that we're in to even get the information that is from a real legit source. Because I think when you've got the support of a community and tribe where there's genuine intention there and there's genuine desire to serve, just being in that can transform and can really support people. I know for myself, just putting myself in the space, when I was first finding my mentors and whatnot, um, there was an amazing guy called Andy, he's an Australian guy who changed my life. Um, he was my first mentor and like he, he really um, just invested in me in a way that I didn't think someone would and um, believed in me thought that I could be someone in this world. And it was through his just giving a shit that I lost like seven stone, that I went from being very anxious, not able to speak to people. Like I was, a, I used to be a housebound agrophobic, so I didn't leave my room for two years. 
That's how fucked and, up. Bro, amazing journey. Like, I just want to congratulate you now you. on being in Port Escondido, doing your thing, taking that leap of faith. And I don't know so much about your journey, but I looked at one of your posts that I saw that showed, I think it showed a picture of you back then. And I was like, wow. <laughs> yes, bruv. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Amazing. Man. I appreciate that, Danny, because it was really, that was other people giving their energy to me because because I was asking for help and they were willing to do it. And people are, and there's good people in this world who will do it. And fortunately now, I've created a bit of a space. I've created a bit of a container. You know, I've, I've got, I've done a lot of different things to pay it back because I'm grateful for what people did for me. And um, on the aspect of energy, I want us to dive into this more because I think you're someone with a very strong energy. And I think your energy, if it hits the right people, it is very transformative. You said something there about how it's all a transmission. You've got to dive into this more, man. When, when things aren't working for people, what's going on there? Like what stifles people's energy? Many things. Being out of alignment with our highest truth is one of the main ones. But yeah, when I say energy don't lie, right, and transmission, Tesla said, if you want to, in a, he didn't say inner stand, but I say inner stand, yeah, because I'm very, very big on words. I'm very sharp with my articulation because when we talk we're casting spells that's why it's called spelling yeah that's why i don't say sick i say healthy that's why i don't say it's wicked i say it's divine i'll even go so far as i won't kill two birds with one stone i'll liberate two peacocks with one crystal you know i play with words and so i say inner stand because i ain't standing under anyone i'm standing in my sovereignty with my beliefs and you know my articulation so if you want to understand the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Okay? So everything... I said this at a men's meeting the other day. Someone said something about woo-woo and spirituality. And I, I said to the group, I was like, yes, we need to be grounded, men, women, within this reality, you know, take care of our day-to-day -day, uh, logistical commitments of our body, our training and everything. But when we throw about terms like woo-woo, I know what people are saying, but the root of our very existence is spiritual. And it, it's just how aware or not people are of that. It doesn't matter if they're atheist and they say, no, 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 I don't believe in it. That's okay. The root of your existence is still spiritual, as is mine, as is everyone's. And so everything in all of creation, is part of great spirit, part of the universe. You should be the creator. And it's all vibrating at different frequencies. So I remember at one point in my journey, I was trying to understand what you mean this, like this bit of paper is God. Yeah, everything, even the space in between is God. So with these different varying vibrational frequencies that everyone and everything is carrying, you can feel it the more... I shouldn't speak for, I can feel it and others can feel it the more aware we become and the more we mm, get in tune with ourselves and clean up our vibration. So with the shamanic work that I do with people, it's multidimensional in the layers that I work in. So some people will come in to do ceremony with me, for instance, and I will always check into a certain person's energy field before I work with them. And if that sounds like weird to someone, you can look up Krillian imagery. Yeah? It's a way to take a photographic uh, representation of the energy field around the living thing. So when people come in to do work with me, coaching or shamanic, but always shamanic, I do this, I will check that energy field. So some people can get in the jungle, they have a name for this, it's called Panema. So as I imagine, if you look at the sky, when it's a pure, clear sky, there's no clouds, yeah? It's just you can see the light shining through. But when you look in the sky and there's clouds everywhere, it blocks the light. So panema can be like a metaphor for having clouds around you. And it's like more heavy energy. It's nothing in particular. It's like in the sense of if I didn't shower for a few days and I got covered in mud and stuff, you'd say, yeah, you're dirty. You're physically dirty. I just think I'm dirty. I don't have a shower, clean myself up. Energetically, that happens as well. But people don't have the awareness of that, so they're not able to clean themselves unless they bring awareness to it or get someone to do it. So you've got that side of it. Then you have people can start getting 
like energetic attachments. You can say like bad spirits, entities, different things that can latch on to people that will really fuck their vibration. That stuff is very real. And I do work removing those kinds of things from people and the change that they witness in their life immediately is insane. So these things are very real. There's like how we're living in our day to day outside of what's going on outside of what we can pick up of like, how am I keeping my space? You know, so is the space nice and neat, clean? Do I burn incense? light candles, burn frankincense? Do I make sure the feng shui, the energy is flowing nicely through my living space? Am I eating whole foods from the earth that are in tune with my biological being that are going to build me and nourish me and bring me to a higher vibrational frequency? In my belief system, that doesn't mean being vegan and all this, so you can only eat plants. I eat red meat every day, but it means am I eating whole foods from the earth that work in sync with my body to bring my vibration, my awareness up? Am I cutting out the self-care products that contain fluoride and aluminium and other cancer-causing chemicals to allow my body to function optimally, to allow my pineal gland to be like a radio antenna, to pick up messages from the universe and to put my frequency out? All these different things are playing into our vibration frequency. Are we being authentic? Am I spreading love? Am I acting from the heart with integrity, with like fulfilling my highest purpose? Or am I not? Am I living way below my potential, like drinking alcohol, taking drugs, doing a job that I fucking hate and all these things? Those will lower the vibration. So when I talk about all this, I hope that kind of extrapolates it a bit. But it's a transmission when you're working with someone. So like you now, compared to you seven years ago, whenever you said it was, or, or you were seven stone more, you know what I'm talking about, that when you work with a coaching client now, your vibration, your transmission, your frequency is fucking powerful. And that's part of what transforms them beyond the words because they're buying into you. Yeah, so I remember one guy said to me, his, his business won't go and get well life coaching. And I said, bro, would you fucking pay yourself to coach you? And I know the answer. So go away and do an audit on your life and think about what you need to change and start showing up like that being in your day to day. And then by the laws of the universe, you're going to start attracting people in because you're going to become magnetic. But the life is always watching. When I say God is everything, great spirit is everything. We're always being witnessed by the universe, by ourselves, by our subconscious, but by all of creation is always observing. We're a child of the universe that the universe wants to thrive and succeed. But it's like, are you showing up for it? Are you being a dickhead and just wasting all this potential and all your God-given talents with a fully able mind and body? You know, so the universe is watching us at all times. So the more that we, when no one's watching, in the stand, like the laws of karma, the laws of the universe, am I living in alignment with my truth? Am I trying to be in integrity with every situation? Am I doing my best to be a kind human and serve on this planet? When the universe is witnessing that and we're witnessing that of ourselves, our vibration, our energy just be so powerful, people feel it. It's a transmission. Does that make sense? Yeah. That makes perfect sense and it's beautiful. And just listening to you there, you show the whole journey that you've been on, the awareness that you've gained, the knowledge, the experience, the skills, the multitude of tools that you've gathered We've been on a journey in this world. I've certainly been on one for quite a while. When I speak to people like you, what really gets me fascinated is understanding what shaped them and the tools and the experience and the things that allowed them to develop the knowledge base that they've got. I know that you're really big on certain tools and that's why you use them in your practices and that's why you teach them to other people, people who are your clients, people who come to uh, the ceremony or retreat with you. It's the certain things that you believe in because they've worked for you and you've seen them work for others. How I would like us to like flesh this out and understand it is you've been on an inner journey that's put you here. You're changing people's lives now. That inner journey started at a certain point and it was driven along by experiences, tools, things you've learned, concepts, ideas, and you've gathered that over your life. 
what I'd like us to do is to dive into this <clears throat> and understand what made you the awakened leader you are. What were the tools? What were the experiences? What has equipped you with what you now know? Can you guide us through that? For sure. So I would say from a very young age, I had a very inquisitive soul, a lot of curiosity, uh, quite adventurous as well. And as we've already discussed, coming to Ibiza was like a game changer. And after my first summer season here, I went back to the UK and went back to my old job in the investment banking for six weeks. And within that six weeks, I was like, no, I can't, I can't come back to this after that. So I decided to go on my first trip backpacking that came about from going in the pub <laughs> bumping into someone that I used to go boxing with and them saying that they were going to thailand and i was like wow i would love to go to thailand that sounds so cool and uh bless his soul he said to me yeah, you can come with us if you want they were all a bit older than me but i was like really and he said yeah so i was like okay i'm there done so hand him my notes in again <laughs> and off i went to thailand and from there i think i went to bali for a couple of weeks and then after Bali, I went to Australia. I met up with a couple of women that I knew from Ibiza to travel the East Coast. So I went from Sydney up to Cairns. And that started this uh, yearly uh, adventure of Ibiza for the summer season and then going backpacking for the winter. So I've traveled to, I've, loved, I've stopped counting, but over 70 countries. So I'm very well traveled. I've seen a lot of the world. And at that young age, like that was very learning for me to go out and experience new environments, new people, new cultures, new belief systems, new foods and everything. It was just like learning, just like a wealth of experience of like all these different things. I would, yeah, I did a bit of partying, but I was living in Ibiza in the summers and I loved my music and was very into what I was into. So the music, when I went away in these backpacking places, you dog shit. I see all these young kids dancing. Like, this is garbage. Like, so I wasn't really on a party vibe. I was more wanting to have experiences, like going to the jungle and see the nature and learning to scuba dive as soon as I went away. So all these things were giving me a wealth of knowledge of the outer world and was growing me along the way. And I, I believe life, whatever it brings us, is always happening for us, not to us. You know, it's for our soul to learn, to evolve, to get to where it's meant to be in this lifetime if we fulfill our potential. Um, as I had been traveling, I remember distinctly that India was somewhere that really made me start to question a more spiritual side of things, the more metaphysical side of reality. Like I remember as a teenager thinking I was an atheist and saying, yeah, like, oh God, you know, science has all the answers. It's black and white which is funny, it's ludicrous when I look back now, but that, that was where I was at. But with all this travel and stuff, I started opening my mind. And in India, I was like, there, there's more to this. This ain't just bricks and mortar reality. There, there's a spiritual undercurrent. I'm starting to feel it, I'm starting to appreciate it. And from a very young age, I was, I was, as I say, very curious. And I was looking into, you know, what people call conspiracy theories that are just like, hidden truths uh, and I was looking into all these different documentaries like Thrive if people haven't seen that watch Thrive it's amazing there's so many documentaries I watched it I was taking all this in and I was like using my own discernment to say does this resonate but so much of it did I was like this makes so much more sense than the lies that I've blatantly realized I've been told as I'm seeing and hearing these truths and the uh, secrets of the universe like that the flower of life and all this stuff and how it's the beginning of creation I'm like wow I'm having my mind blown so all these different things. And then when I get to, it must have been when I was 26, I remember being at an after party out here in Ibiza with some people and someone mentioned the ayahuasca. Now, if anyone in your audience doesn't know what ayahuasca is, it's a traditional indigenous plant medicine from the Amazon rainforest. And it's created from two different plants. One is the ayahuasca vine, which isn't actually psychoactive. That contains a monoamine oxidized inhibitor which means it stops the enzyme in the body that would break down DMT from breaking it down. And then there's another plant, Chacruna, that gets cooked up the ayahuasca vine, and that contains dimethyltryptamine, which is the active alkaloid that leads to people having these visionary spiritual experiences with a medicine. So anyway, I've heard about this ayahuasca. Guys told me what it's about, and I'm like, that sounds like the most interesting thing I've ever heard of and almost what I've been looking for my entire life. 
So as I say, I was super interested in like the paranormal and supernatural. I was always trying to explore the grey areas that sat between the black and white and life. I was always doing like overnight vigils in the most haunted places in the UK, which was quite interesting and you know, I was diving into all that stuff. But when I heard this, I was like, no, I think this is what I've been looking for. So for six months, I've researched that. And I just kept getting more and more like, if this is true, why does everyone not know about this? Like, This stuff sounds like it is the game changer most people are looking for. So it was, it was I think my seventh summer in Ibiza, I was 27. I've been researching all of that and I was going to go backpacking again. I was going to go to China and Japan. But for the first time I'd ever experienced this in such a profound way in my life, a voice come into my head and said, no, Danny, you're going to go drink ayahuasca now. You're not going traveling. We're going to drink ayahuasca. And I was like, okay, all right then. So I started asking around. I thought I was going to go to Peru. Uh, but anyway, cut long story short, I didn't. Multiple people suggested that I go do this work somewhere in Europe. I won't say where. Um, and that it might be better the first time. Some of the people that speak my language and, you know, more familiar surroundings. So I got some numbers. I called around, but it was the fourth people I think the third or the fourth that I called and as soon as they answered the phone I was like that's the people that I'm going to drink with so they said we've got one coming up in three weeks I told them my background and they's like we feel like you need to be on it just to give you a little understanding of where I was at and what was calling me to this I was in Ibiza doing things I shouldn't have been doing yeah, you don't need to be Einstein to work out I'm in Ibiza involved with a party scene I know a lot of people coming out here I was doing things for money that you know I weren't feeling fulfilled from and I knew it was not like a long-term plan for me so I wanted to go and drink this medicine really like my questions were what is my purpose I didn't, I didn't know what my purpose was and that's really what I wanted to find and also, I had some big questions that were beyond like, oh, I've had my heart broken in this relationship. Or, oh, I need to process this trauma. I was like, what the fuck is this? What is this life? What is this experience that I'm having? I remember I used to be doing the washing up and stuff, but I just stopped and just like start looking around. I was like, what the fuck is this? How am I even here? How does this exist? You know, my consciousness was, was bringing awareness to the fact of like, what is the great mystery? How did this come to be? So... I went there with these questions and they said, yeah, three weeks. So anyway, there was no space. They made a space for me. I went to Morocco for uh, a couple of weeks, done a bit of traveling to, to fill that time, loved it and come back. And I went on the retreat. So it was two nights uh, drinking ayahuasca. I didn't know what to expect. I've read everything you could read and watch all the documentaries, but that will never prepare you for it ever. It's like sex. You could read all the books, but until you have it, you ain't going to know what that experience is like, yeah. So I went there and I was like a little puppy in the car asking my mate about it. Like, oh, this guy that picked me up to take me that I just met, us. he's a very good friend now. And he's like, saying, well, you're going to see, you know. So the first night, I'm on my little bed and they're like, you can come up for the medicine. So I've drunk the medicine, gone back to my bed and I've heard there's a lot of like puking and all this. Well, anyway, with me, I just start feeling vibrations within my being like very quickly. And within 10 minutes, I'm out of my body. And I'm like, what the fuck? So my spirit has left my being and I'm in another dimension of reality, which I've never experienced before in my 27 years of being alive. And I get met by who I found out to be one of my guides. So it's an Egyptian god called Horus. And I didn't remember the name then, but I remembered what he looked like. This is the eye of Horus here, this little tattoo. And I'm so excited to go to Egypt uh, in September to explore this Egypt connection. But anyway, this, this being took me on a tour of different dimensions. And I've got to be honest, some of them felt very hellish. And the, the, the message that I felt, not like words, it was just like telepathy, was you want to do good in your life because if you don't do good and you continue on the path that you're continuing on, although I wasn't a bad person at heart, I didn't realize the implications karmically of doing things that didn't bring good to people. It's like, if you carry on on the path you are, you may have to pay back some karma in some of these realms. And I don't think you want that. So maybe look at what you're doing in your life. And, and this is all like mixed in with loads of like sacred geometry and colors and being in different dimensions and, you know, some of it was magic, but then quite a bit of it was terrifying. 
I don't know how long because it come out of time and space when we go into these these other realms and then I come back into my body and I was just like there was no puking and I said you know what I'm never doing that again fuck this shit I want to leave tomorrow like I'm not doing the second night so I voiced that I was an erratic I was just like I'm quite sure that I'm done with it and then they said like, okay all good relax chill sleep and we'll see how you're feeling tomorrow tomorrow relax processed it a bit I was like I'm here for the weekend do you know what I mean just, just get involved it can't be can't be no stronger, famous last words. <laughs> so I did the second night. So then that night, drunk again. And this was so powerful. Fuck me. Like I literally, and I've had it happen multiple times now with medicine, but I literally died. My spirit fully left and went back to source to merge with creator. Now to explain that in a tangible way for someone to maybe understand it is like imagine taking your consciousness away from planet earth or the human experience of from the identity of danny and then imagine that as a drop of salt water and then i just drop that back in the ocean yeah so i my spirit was a drop that went back into the ocean of pure consciousness so i was that one consciousness i knew that i was the essence and energy behind everything manifest and there was such a purity to it. It was like pure white, limitless vibration. And I was it. And there was no I of Danny or no human being on planet Earth. From there, I came back through all these almost like dimensions or layers of reality. I remember one as I was just coming out of there being like Christ consciousness. And I felt like Jesus. I thought like float in and and then I come down to more visceral layers of reality until I come back into the womb of Mother Earth. And that's when I remember opening my eyes and shaking tremendously, like a hummingbird, like at such a high rate of vibration, uh, with a team of people around me. And I was just like, what has just happened? And I said, I've been reborn. I said to him, I've lit I've just been reborn. And he was like, oh, we were a bit worried about you. Are you okay, yeah? And I was like, yeah, everyone else had finished and I like, was eating in the in the kitchen and stuff. And I was like, wow. So that that changed the game. From then, it's like a line in the sand in my life, like before and after. Nothing could ever be the same after that. Because with, say, religions or different things, you can have faith in what a good book is telling you to believe or suggesting maybe real or not but what i had and what plant medicine in my opinion has the ability to give someone is a is a direct experience of the divine a direct experience of communing with our spiritual nature in such a profound visceral tangible way that you have zero doubt for the rest of your life that you are an eternal being that is spiritual at the very root of your core and so from there, uh, it was a lot to integrate that. I remember I used to wake up in the night and be like having these mad vibrations running through me. And I'd shifted dramatically. Imagine Bitcoin just went on a tear. Like if you saw a fucking chart of my life it's like, oh, in vibration, I went up a lot. And I could I started seeing so many synchronicities, numbers. That's why I've got the old 1111 tattoo here. And I'm very big on I'm always seeing numbers everywhere, number patterns. But I started seeing the mysteries of the universe being revealed to me, the people that I was meeting, I'd meet people. And it was like spirit would almost put like a sparkle around them as I, as my eye clocked them and say, go and speak to them. And it, it was the beginning of following the right rabbit and starting to trust my gut, my intuition, understand this is a dream that I'm in and it's magical. Uh, and I became fascinated bro, with shamanism. Like, I was just like, this is the most tremendous thing in the world. And there's so many paths that lead back to the oneness, that lead back to truth. You know, some people resonate with religion, whether that be like Christianity or Islam, Judaism. Uh, you have more philosophies that wouldn't like maybe pigeonhole themselves as a religion like Buddhism. You've got yoga, tantra, all these different things. But my thing is shamanism. Like As soon as I found that, I was like, wow, that's that's me. I'm fascinated in this. I want to dedicate part of my life to this. Uh, and just to to kind of flush out what is shamanism or what is the role of like someone who's stepping onto the path of a shaman, whether some people have like negative connotations, that word or whatever, but let's just define the word. In, in my opinion, um, a shaman or a shamanic facilitator is someone there's varying degrees, of course, like there is with any 
field of expertise, but it's really being able to be a bridge between the spirit world and the divine and the physical world and being able to bring energies between the two and ideally facilitate an awakening for individuals after having it facilitated for self and to facilitate healing on a more mystical level, on a more vibrational, energetic level um, than bricks and mortar medicine, you know, uh, and to have a high level of awareness, to be able to mm, discern between truth and, and false in what we see around us in the world, you know, seeing behind the veil of things, seeing through the smoke and mirrors, being able to really uh, understand what's going on around us. So that became one of my tools. Very soon after the ayahuasca, and this is a little story in itself, I went into my, I, people had crystals at these retreats, and I was like, I fucking loved crystals as a child. So I want to find the little collection of crystals that I had. So I went into the attic at my parents' house, and I looked everywhere. And then the last thing, of course, that I found was this tin. I was like, ah, I think I remember. Yeah, here's all the crystals. But when I opened that tin, there was this plastic frog figurine sitting on the top. And it was an Amazonian frog. It wasn't the Cambo frog because it was a, a yellow and black toy frog. But it was sitting there. And I swear to you, when I saw it, I heard the words Cambo, Cambo. Whether I already, I can't re honestly remember, but whether I already had heard of Cambo once or twice, or I'd not even heard of it, I don't know. But that's what come to me. Two days later, I went to this event in London. It was called Gathering of Minds. And I was at home and it was raining and I didn't know anyone going. I was like, I don't want to go to this. I can't be asked. But Spirit came to me and said, no, you go. You go, boy. You get on that train. So I was like, all right. <laughs> so I went out, got on the train, walked into the venue. And there was a woman on the door taking the tickets. And I saw the sparkles around. I was like, I need to talk to her. So it started. So I went in. Great event. And then once... <laughs> It finished, I made a point to go and speak to this woman. So I said, I went and said, hi, you know, I'm Danny, what do you do? She said to me, I serve Cambo. I was like, boom, there we go. That's why <laughs> I got the message. So I said, look, I want to sit with you as soon as possible. When can we do it? She said, in two days. So I organized it for my house. And then me and my friend Roya, she was a brave soul that stepped up to the plate to do it with me for the first time, sat together. So I ended up having seven points. The medicine's applied by little points of them. It can't, it's a secretion from a frog from the Amazon rainforest, yeah? So when you're doing it outside of the rainforest, the practitioner will mix the dried medicine on a stick with water and make little balls. And then the way in which it's applied, like up on the arm, I'll have got little dots there. So a light burn is made to open up the lymphatic system, taking off the top layers of the epidermis, and the medicine gets placed on. So I did seven points, which was the most that she gave for a first time. That was between three and seven. And it was intense. Oh, I was not ready for that. It was intense. Literally start puking your guts up immediately and have been fasting. But yet all these deep colors are coming out, like yellow and orange and brown of toxins from the body. And then I fainted. And I don't know what happened in that moment. I fainted, but it felt like I dipped into another reality. And when I come back, I had this message that was over and over in my head, Danny, you need to learn as much as you can about this. And I was like, okay. So I messaged her the next day, Sade, shout out to Sade, thank you. Um, I messaged her the next day. And I said, look, I'd love to assist you in this work. I'd love to organize ceremonies at my home. I'll get the people. I'll provide the space, you keep the money. All I want to do is be able to watch and learn about this medicine. Unbeknownst to me, she, she told me after like a few weeks later that she had sat and meditated that night and got a message, Danny's going to become like a facilitator with this medicine. So if he reaches out, please help him. So there we go, like I reached out and it all started. So we were doing that for six months and I was sitting re very regularly, like every ceremony we did at mine, I would assist and then sit at the end. and. Then it came to the point that the woman that taught her was offering a training over in Portugal. So I was like, yeah, I'm in. I went and did that. And then I started serving the Cambo. You know, so that was something that came into my journey. And when I drank ayahuasca, it told me very clearly, stop drinking and stop taking drugs. But I found it hard to completely knock it on the head. There'd still be a little gin and tonic or a little liner gear or whatever. But when I did the Cambo, 
boom, from the first time, it's like an off switch. And yeah. just nothing from them for four years. A couple of times after the four years, I drank some wine. I consciously had MDMA or whatever a couple of times after, but for four years, I touched nothing from that Cambo. And I just became fascinated. And I found out that there's all these other plant medicines. There's Wachuma, also known as San Pedro, a cactus. I've got one growing out there. There's Poyote. There's Iboga from Africa, from the Bawiti tribe, which is like a masculine version of ayahuasca, you could say almost, but from Africa. Uh, you've got Bufo that comes from the venom glands of a toad. Can you believe you can squeeze the venom glands of a toad, dry what comes out, smoke that without doing anything to it, and you'll have a direct experience of God. It's the most potent psychedelic known to man. And you have DMT, Changa, mushrooms, and all, in my opinion, all of these different plant medicine teachers have been gifted to us by Mother Earth and Creator as ways for us to heal and cleanse our mind, body, and spirit and commune with the divine and remember who the fuck we are. And I feel they played a vital role in our development as a species, in developing art, uh, ideas around spirituality, culture, language. Like they're so powerful. And in my opinion, there's a reason that they're illegal in many countries and that they're not spoken about and that they're potentially demonized as well because they have the power to completely break us out of the illusion of social conditioning that we've been put under since we were born. So they're very, very powerful. Uh, so And so, the, yeah, the, this was one part and these are one of the tools that I like to utilize in my awakening and with others but then there's uh so many things i looked into like when i was living in Yang in thailand this they call it tantra island so i started exploring tantra which is like the neo tantra the new tantra is very much based around sexuality um but also presence with life um and the enjoyment of life i'm not rushing so dived into tantra you know i went and studied uh, metaphysics center in guatemala called las pyramids and did a month there living in a little pyramid and doing some training there i've worked with coaches i've been part of group coaching um i've been on retreats uh studied yoga meditation qigong you know i went to the the thing that the medicine told me after my first night was you need to go and study nutrition because i'd always been fascinated in nutrition and how it affected the body he said you're not going to go back to a beach and do that shit you're going to next week start studying at college naturopathic medicine so i've been flirting the idea and i was like so i literally moved to manchester the next week after my first ayahuasca ceremony didn't go traveling and started studying at the college of naturopathic medicine and I, and I had, the funny thing was, I, I'd managed to get a job at RBS doing investment banking again. And because I was like, if I'm going to be in the UK, I need to be earning lots of money. And this is the only thing that I can see that I have a skill set and that's going to provide it. So I got this job for RBS. It was all part of Spirit's plan to get me to commit to the study, move to Manchester. But bro, after one month, I, I said to the manager, I'm like, I'm so sorry to have wasted your time. But the words I said, but this is killing my soul. I can't do this. Cannot do this. And so I quit. And then... I sat in my room and I was like, what would be my dream job now? Remembering this is 11 years ago. So this is where I was at. But my dream job then was to be a part-time nutritionist in the eighth day vegetarian co-op in Manchester. So I picked up the phone. I called the eighth day and I said, do you have any jobs going at the minute? And they said, yeah, we've just got one come up. It's a part-time nutritionist and we haven't had this job for years. It's because the woman's gone on maternity leave. I was like, I would love to to apply for that role and so i did and lo and behold i got the job minimum wage but i fucking loved it because i learned so much from the woman there that was head of nutrition and she took me under her wing and was teaching me loads of things yeah it didn't last that long maybe i was there six months because i also felt a little bit uh not like i wanted to be stacking the shelves as well and doing them bits and in the end i was like yeah and i moved on to planet organic in london and was like in a bit more of like nutritionist role but bro, yeah, the, you know, the path just opened up and, and bit by bit started following the white rabbit and diving into loads and loads of new things, loads of new potentials and just seeing what I enjoyed. You know, another thing that just jumps to mind now is ecstatic dance. That was another thing that I went to in amongst all these different experiences. And when I first went into my first ecstatic dance in Nevada City in California, 
just to explain what ecstatic dance is, we grow up very used to like a music club and experience of we go in, stand there with a drink at our chest, talk to middle lads, mm. like, uh, uh, sniffing gear in the toilets. You know, and if you dance, you're like, you're doing your kind of normal stomp where ecstatic mm. dance has no drink, no drugs, no talking, very high vibe conscious beings and radical self-expression and fluidity and freedom of movement. So I went in there and I was already well on this vibe, but it's my first one. I was like, oh, I feel a little bit uncomfortable in these first 10 minutes with watching how these people are moving and how I've danced. But within 10 minutes, I'm like proper, got my arms going everywhere, everywhere, really expressing myself to the music. And so that is a great practice and has been in letting go of judgment of me fully dancing in my splendor and majesty and radiance of my self-expression and now you see me on a dance floor like in one of my silk kimonos i'll get my silk fans out when i'm dj and i'll bring the silk fans out like a dragon and be spinning them round. and it's like radical self-expression and just like shining our light you know so there's so many different tools that i've utilized and stand by it and also there's so much to be said just for coming back to basics people want to do all the latest the biohacking and all this it's like bro what water are you drinking are, are, are you drinking tap water like wake up please can you start can you get a reverse osmosis system feared can you get like a really high level water filter filtration system i don't mean brita that ain't worth a wank all right, it might take a little bit out, but something really good. Can Are you getting organic foods? Are you eating nourishing whole foods and cutting out the rubbish? Have you stopped drinking alcohol and stopped taking drugs? You know, are you doing the, the, the basic things, bringing it back to the most basic, going to the gym? The gym's one of the most powerful tools. Like we can be all like, oh, namaste, doing all this meditation. One of the most powerful things is going to the gym and lifting weights, like building a strong being. I feel like as men anyway, we should be like savages and saints at the same time, like a sage that distills wisdom and shares that with his brothers and with the sisters and just helps to enlighten others, but also is a savage, a savage cunt that like that, you know, if it comes to it, if you've got to go into war, you've got to protect, uh, you, you've got that down as well. You know, a capable man on a multidimensional level. Listening to that is fucking inspiring. Yeah. Good. And powerful. Just so much of what you've shared there. Like, it's amazing. And, and there's I'm, so I'm, many tools. I could go on and on. You know, and and there's very there's big ones like what I said earlier on in the interview. Sorry, I just wanted to say this. It's like tools in awareness. Like I said, the articulation that we bring to our vocabulary, the way we converse is so important. It frustrates me massively the way a lot of people speak because they don't understand that our language has been in infiltrated and bastardized purposely. And you see all these people saying, oh, sick, oh, wicked, uh, I crushed it, killed it, smashed it. They're all negative contracting terms. Like we want to elevate and expand. And also everything after I am, I become. I never berate myself. I love myself so much and will always say really positive things about myself. Not in a boastful way, not in an arrogant way, in a self-appreciating way. And like, I deserve this life. I am like an amazing human being, as are all the others that want to wake up and understand that. But like when I use the tools of invoking universal energy by saying things like, I am a visionary, I am this, I am that, and that one always stands out to me. I'm a visionary. Like, I shit you not, I started having the most visionary concepts and ideas coming to me. This is how Love Dance was born. This is how Kings of Mastery was born. How Metamorphosis Medicina and the Destiny of Your Dreams was born. All of my four projects. Through start standing and saying, I'm a visionary. Like I'm going to create businesses that change the world. Projects that change the world. That make me so prosperous and so abundant because of how powerfully I can serve through all of these passion heart led projects. You know, really rewiring our brain and, and getting past those limiting beliefs and understanding our expansive potential is powerful beyond belief. Anyone who's just listened to that is going to be hit at a very raw and emotional level. I mean, I was, and they're going to be thinking like, 
how can I make this work? I mean, just so many of the things that you shared, like they were mind blowing to me. And I mean, I have to ask you some some questions about this. So please. You shared about how when you use Cambo, you didn't drink for like four years after that and you didn't have any temptation or anything of this sort. Like, why is this? So <clears throat> we got to understand, yeah, that our body's been poisoned from birth. Our body has been poisoned from birth, as has our mind, as has our spirit. The body's been poisoned by processed foods, by a bastardized water coming from a tap full of chemicals, by radiation, by all sorts of different contaminants. Our mind has been poisoned from birth by the tell lies to my vision, the television that people have in the front room, brainwashing them and conditioning them to believe the propaganda and the narrative of the ruling elite. So we've been shut down and limited in our potential and in our inner standing. We're put in this little box here yeah, that my uh, ayahuasca experience blew to smithereens. So I was already like out of the box. So I'd already kicked it in. The ayahuasca just threw petrol on it and burnt it up. But we've got so much toxicity on a mind, body, spirit level that we need to rid ourselves of. And it's through all these different things, like the purity of the water and the food and everything. But then you can get really powerful, ancient, indigenous medicines that we can utilize as tools to really ramp that process up and accelerate it. So the Cambo, this has been studied by Western scientists as well. This isn't just, you know, the tribes in the jungle and some hippie motherfuckers around the world going, yeah, this is the real deal. The, the pharmaceutical companies were getting this medicine from within the 1980s and to this day and studying it and saying, wow, what is in this is amazing. It's full of all these bioactive peptides that catalyze amazing processes within the human body that are highly beneficial. Don't ask me the exact mechanism of action for this. Goodbye, Mr. Mosquito. Don't ask me exactly how this works, but when it goes on, very quickly, you start feeling the heart rate increasing, the heartbeat in the ears, you feel heat in the body. I, I'm looking at the people while I'm serving them and they're going red. So I'm like, yeah, I know that they're feeling it. And it, it flushes through the body. You just feel it. And then you drunk a lot of water beforehand and people just start puking. And it has this ability to kick toxins out of the lymphatic system and also the bile duct. So the body just starts like dumping all these like toxins and the water is like the vehicle which carries it out of the body and into the bucket. And I've been serving this medicine now for a decade. Yes, I've got a lot of experience with it and I've definitely given it to over a thousand people. Like I, I haven't kept count, I don't know, but a lot. I've done a lot of ceremonies over the decade and I've seen it work magic with many, many, many people. The benefits range from subtle to people like, yeah, I think it's, it's done, done me some good to life changing. The general feeling is like, wow, yeah, I feel really good after this, clear headed, vibrant, driven. Uh, yeah, just back on top form, waking up early, fresh, not wanting to like smoke or drink that uh, smoke and drink alcohol and all these other things. Yeah. And for some people, they message me. I've had people messaging me in tears going, This is like completely changed my life. This is so amazing. Uh, but it has the ability to clean us out, mind, body, and spirit. Remembering it clears that panema, which can be the heavy energy that we're not even aware of, but that can be just holding us back. But physically, what it kicks out. The, the less dirty something is, the more splendor and majesty and radiance it's going to feel. Like if my room's a shithole and I come back here after a day out, I'm going to be like, oh, this doesn't feel good. Where When it's all clean and it smells good, I'm like, ah, oh, this is lovely. You lay on the bed. It's nice. You know, the cells in our body feel like that. As above, so below. You know, when our body's a shithole, it, it leads to toxic thoughts uh, toxic cravings. We just want to eat rubbish food. We have parasites, you know, that are releasing chemicals to make us want to eat all sugar and stuff. So it's harboring an unhealthy environment for our mind, body, and spirit. So when you do this combo and clean out, and it can also like bring up emotional stuff to be released, all of a sudden the spirit finds itself in a much cleaner and more high vibration home. And so the mind just works different. In instead of being like, oh, I'm going to go and get a Domino's and you know, have a few beers and watch Celebrity Love Island. 
and so I, oh, I'm going to have like a really nice nourishing meal. I might do some meditation. I'm going to go for a walk. You know, we're, the cleaner our body is, the less we harbor toxic desires and habits. So does that make sense? Yeah, that does make okay. sense. It's something that I also saw in my own life when I look back at the person I used to be and how I ended up like that. I used to be obese. I used to have a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety. And I used to be very much um, kind of defeated as a person because of a lot of challenging circumstances. When I went on my healing journey, which was a lot of different things, it was a lot of breath work, a lot of like visualization, a lot of just getting in touch with nature was the biggest thing that did a lot for me at that stage of my life anyway putting myself back in the earth, putting myself back on, actually connecting with it, you know, t t taking my clothes off and actually being in, in union with it, that the weight dropped. My mind started clearing up. My actual being changed. I went from not really happy with what I was doing, working as a project manager, which was a good job, but I knew there was so much more. As I took care of my body and, Really, that was a big thing. Um, everything started taking off. The things that I thought I couldn't do, I began to do. And at a certain point, I knew I was ready and uh, pretty much went on a very aggressive three years of just transformation, goal achievement, moving from country to country, starting my business, just going forward. That was from addressing this, working on this. It wasn't necessarily that um, a bolt of inspiration came to me. It was just, I just humbled myself. I just understood that, like, I'm going to need to connect with nature again. And it starts to take off. It's where now, we're but... from. It's, we've become so disconnected. And that's where so many of our problems arise from our disconnection from nature, the inflammation in our beings, you know, from not eating normal food clean water from not connecting barefoot with the earth which has unlimited free electrons to take the inflammation out of our being you know so it makes so much sense and it was a big part of my journey although luckily i was in ibiza and traveling so i was always really at one with nature yeah and like having gone through that and seen like how transformative that was for me it did shape my worldview and it shaped my view of, like who we are in this world how we see things and also helped me understand some of the like wider problems we see in society with loneliness of isolation but my background was of experiencing a lot of isolation after a certain point my earlier sort of 20s were quite challenging mid 20s quite challenging then of course made a significant comeback and now fortunately those are far far from my life i've got an abundant life in many ways when I think about what I see in the world and when I think about the problems I see, the insecurities, the loneliness, the way people just connect with each other, the, the, the lack of like deeper connections and bonds and community and whatnot, in my opinion, significant part of that is just how disconnected we are from nature. I wonder, and one another. We, we ch uh, chatted recently, a little bit of an exchange, and as I was sending you a video you said something in your response which i want to pick up on here about really achievement and success you said success is an inside job clearly it was for me and it's done a lot for me but a lot of people in this world aren't getting that i wonder like what's your view on that and um, what do you think are some things that are in the modern world mean that people are disconnected in the first place so yes yeah, success transformation mm, how we experience life it, it yeah to, to transform it it is an all all is an inside job life is literally a mirror life is how we are you know what we're seeing in the world if someone has a negative mindset and wants to see the negative in everything our experience of day-to-day -day life and living is going to be, you know, not 
positive. It's get always moaning like, oh, that's just my luck. This always happens to me. Can't believe this has happened again. Oh, no. You know, how we look at the world completely shapes it. Where if we have a positive mindset, we have faith, we trust. We believe that the universe wants the best for us. And we don't just believe that whilst being a lay around bum. We believe that while showing up for ourselves, while showing up for our dreams, while showing the highest level of self-love and self-respect. And I always try and educate people on this self-love and self-respect. Yeah, they're the same thing. So if I, someone said to me the other day, why don't I drink? I said, because I love myself. Yeah, so if I love myself, I don't want to poison myself. I'm not an idiot. Now, I'm not projecting that on anyone else that does choose to drink. That's my words to myself. I'm not a fucking idiot. So I don't choose to poison myself with tools of the opposition. Yeah, if you, if you I'd recommend anyone to go onto YouTube and listen to Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. Yeah, his family didn't release that book until they had all passed because they thought it'd be too controversial. But it's like Napoleon Hill interviewing the devil. And he speaks about how he controls 98% of the world's population, the devil, with alcohol, tobacco, and the fear of death and poverty. Now, just to bring some awareness, tobacco is one of the master teacher plants in shamanism. And tobacco in its raw form is a medicine. And when I say raw, like unbastardized in the sense that it hasn't been mixed with all the chemicals and made to Marlboro. You know, it, that's, a, that's just something I want to add. It, it can be used for healing. What they, when, he, when we talk about tobacco in that sense, it's the sense of like bastardization, lucky strike, Marlboro, you know, billions of bad chemicals that are, that are killing the body when it's smoked. But so all these things, when you see them for what they are, it's like, I don't want to put alcohol in my being because I see it as poison. I want to be high vibrational, sensational. And I don't want to put cocaine that's been cut with rat poison and people have been murdered and killed on the journey for this to come to me. Because that's not loving myself or respecting myself. We're not respecting other, the people that have lost our lives in the making of this. So all of these different things about like, what do I want to allow into my being? And then <clears throat> this inner transformation, as I say, comes from really bringing more awareness. It's like, how aware can I be about the 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 thoughts that I'm having, the words I'm speaking, the way that I'm showing up to the world, the way I'm showing up for myself, the more we can start analysing, you know, our, the voice in our head and how we're talking to ourselves and stopping ourselves saying certain words and stopping ourselves berating ourselves and start doing visualisation and also affirmations if it's helpful to people. Like, I am, I love myself, I am amazing, I am worthy, I deserve this. Uh, and, and letting go of these blocks that have held us back, limiting belief systems have been put in place maybe by hearing our parents talk about cash or, or some teacher that said, you can't do that. Da, da, da. I loved when you said earlier that that person, your first mentor said, no, you, you're special. You can do something powerful in the world because you are special and I am special, but everyone's special. And it's just everyone waking up to that and realizing it and moving out of the, this limitation that's been placed upon them of like, oh yeah, you can grow up and become, you work in an office or you become a fireman or a policeman and like play that role of the good boy. You go to university, you get your job, you get married, you have a house. It's like blow that fucking status quo story to smithereens and start dreaming big. Like my coaching, I call the destiny of your dreams because I've always gone for my dream life and I'm living it and I'm elevating into the expanded re realization of that. But like when you get it, this is a fucking dream. Yes, it's very real and tangible, but we're, we are, God, dreaming alive this very existence in every moment. And I always say all of existence is like a mathematical sum that is constantly trying to be balanced by all of the wills and intention of all of those in it. But so many people have been led to believe that they don't have any power within it, and so they don't dream big, and they just fall into the dream and, and do mundane things. But when we awaken from it, it's really like the matrix. Like when we become Neo and we're like, oh yeah, I'm the chosen one because we are all the chosen one living the dream of our life. We can start being really playful with what we want to create. And when we start trusting and believing and showing up for it and really speaking with conviction, it starts happening. It's like, wow. I remember when I first uh, learned the Cambo and my teacher said, yeah, there's this one guy 
and he lives in Thailand in Koh Phangan, and he he does Cambo there. That's all he does the ceremonies. I was like, what? Wait a minute, really? That's insane. That sounds so incredible. Bro, like two years later or whatever, I'm living on that island. I become the main Cambo guy that everyone's coming to. I'm serving it to 20 people a week. And I'm like, oh, wait. So everything's possible. Not just from that thing, but like so many things started happening. I'm like, ah, so this is a game. This is like a playground for my soul to, to create and, and be really playful and start seeing what I can bring through my creative power as a, as a manifester into this reality. And so through all, through all of the refinements I've been speaking about, doing this inner work on the physical level, the mental level, the spiritual level, it starts unlocking these cities, these supernatural abilities, like psychic abilities. It's a bit but how do I know when people come to do ceremony that they're carrying bad energy with them and stuff? I don't even know, but it's unlocked within me to be able to pick up on these things and to call upon like the powers of the universe to do healing work with people. I don't fully understand it. I just in understand that it's there, the ability's there, and I trust it and believe in it, and I see it in the way people react after to how their life shifted. Um so really it's just it's just this journey that can only unfold with time and working with the tools and ideally mentorship which i didn't i never had i worked all this stuff out on my own well i did have mentorship from medicine from god <laughs> from great spirit my mentorship was with medicine and then communion with the divine and with the universe but i didn't have a coach for like almost all the time i just found i just connected the dots and got there so it was a, a longer journey but i feel you know anyone that wants to to come to this level of refinement and awareness, find people that have, like myself, like yourself, like any of these high level people out there that offer these experiences, um, you know, either with plant medicine or with coaching uh, and allow someone to assist you in that journey, you know, like invest in yourself. It, it can be a massive shortcut. I see it now. And then like the last couple of years, I started go going into like men's business coaching groups and different things. And I've learned from them and I see how it can accelerate things. And also the universe sees you saying yes to yourself. The universe sees you saying, I want, I want to learn. I want more for myself. And from them investments, generally like amazing things can come from them. They do. They have for me many, 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 many times. I mean, I just wouldn't even be here if I didn't invest in myself. That's the honest truth. I tried to do it myself. I just couldn't even do it. And I tried until I was 29, until I just humbled myself and asked Andy for help. And then three years later, all the things that I wrote a post about what I want, here I am. I'm in Mexico. I've got my own business. I've done all these things. I've met all these people. I've just smashed it for three years. Living the dream. Elevated it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, honestly speaking, man, like, it's only just getting started, frankly. There's a lot more to come, and it's just going to go up from here. Um, that is to kind of like contain what we've shared today and capture it. I'm going to present an individual as a hypothetical person who's come to you, who's seen this today, who's on the edge of his seat, because this was a fucking epic podcast, like, to say the least. Yeah, mind-blowing, amazing. This guy's name is Fred. He is 35. He is from, um, I say he lives in Fulham in London, and he's kind of in the interplay of where he used to be. He's running around London doing these finance jobs or whatever. And frankly speaking, knows that this is not what he wants. And he knows internally it's killing his soul. And he's not happy about the things he's got, the people that are around him. But he's listening to this podcast today. And he knows there's something here. And he knows that if he could tap into it, then he could change. But he's not sure, like what it looks like for him because it's just not his wheelhouse and it's not his world. But Fred's open-minded and he's coachable and he wants to create something spectacular in his life. He's come to you 
What do you say to them? I say, Fred, what the fuck do you want? What do you really want at a soul level out of life? Because there's two options. It's almost like Morpheus in the Matrix when he gets them tablets up. And he's like, do you want the red one or do you want the blue one? There's two ways we can live our life. You can live your life in the safety and security of what society has set up. So you can be the lion that's in the cage at the zoo. You get fed every day. There's no danger. Don't have to do fuck all. You just go about your day to day as it's been presented to you. Or you take the choice of the wild lion out on the Serengeti. Every day's an adventure. Every day is not that dramatic, you know, in my life, but every day could be life or death because you're fully responsible. You're out there in the real world. There's all the other big players out there that are doing what they want to do. And it's competitive and it's real. Uh, but you feel alive and you have the freedom and the sovereignty to choose what you do with your life. And that can mean death. <laughs> that can mean going hungry. That can mean all of these things. I mean, that metaphor can be slightly watered down for the human because we live in very safe times. And even if we go for the biggest risks and it all goes to shit, you can usually just say, can I stay on your sofa for a bit while I get myself back on my feet? You know, so it's not even that much of a danger. But it's, it's choosing. What do you want? What do you want to go for? The safety of what you know or the calling of the soul that knows there's more, that wants something else? And it doesn't need to be dramatic of like, right, quit the job, right, we're going to all in on this. Let's look at what you want out of life, where you're at now, where you want to get, and then start creating a roadmap. And step by step, start cleaning the diet, you know, cleaning out the things that are wasting time that put in negative beliefs into the head bringing our awareness to our life bringing our focus to things that matter what skill sets can we leverage that we've got to start you know living that dream life or what skill set do we need to begin learning all these different things taking them into account and then step by step you know try trying different things seek and you shall find knock and the door shall open if you come to the universe as a humble student and say look i i want to learn i'm i'm calling him better things in my life the universe will make it so you know your prayers will not go unanswered i was just in peru for three months during the winter so i'm actually getting off of ibiza for a bit and changing the scene i've lived there twice before so it's my third time living in the sacred valley a uh, beautiful place i'll be doing a retreat there next year and i was doing some medicine work so i wasn't holding any ceremonies i was like i want to take a bit of time out there was one guy that I was working with, Miguel, shout out to Miguel, doing Machuma ceremonies up in the mountains behind the town I was living at. And when we were up there one day, we were drinking Machuma, this cactus, very like beautiful grandfather energy, uh, very heart opening. And we're walking in the mountains, it's the most beautiful scenery. And he puts this baseball cap on and it says, pray more <laughs> and worry less. And I, I kept laughing, but it hit me so deep because so profound, pray more worry less so like literally wherever we're at in our lives put some prayers out you can literally commune with existence by putting your prayers out and they can be by in any manner you can sit there like that or you can just lay there or whatever or sometimes i'll just be out in nature on my own i'll just speak speak out loud like i'm speaking to someone so i am i'm speaking to the universe speaking to god speaking my dreams out speaking what i would like assistance with and the time when you can receive the universe's answers to your prayers is through meditation or through slowing down and being quiet, being in nature, shutting the fuck up for a moment, slowing that mind down, allowing some spaciousness for it to come through. So, you know, if you, if you put it out that you want better in your life, hypothetical Fred from Fulham, just start putting them prayers out there to meet the right people, uh, to make the right investments that your gut is saying, yeah, I think I should work with that person. Take them leaps of faith, you know, Early on in our journey, probably you found the same, like we can be a bit edgy about handing over like the investment, and like, is this really gonna work? Or should I go on that retreat? Just fucking do it. Every time I've said yes, so much goodness has come from it. And even sometimes when it don't, we learn what we don't like or what doesn't serve or who doesn't resonate. You know, taking those leaps of faith. 
over and over and over again. And this quote is by me, but I use it quite often. It's like, on the other side of fear lies salvation. Because in my journey, so many times I've been fearful of like, I was, man, I was scared the first time I did Cambo, the first time I drank ayahuasca, the first time I did a lot of these things. But like, I just took that leap of faith and so much healing, so much awakening came from it. So I'd say, yeah, Fred, probably you should do some work with me, bruv. We should do some ceremonies and some coaching or come on one of the retreats. But, you know, yeah, whoever that hypothetical person is, they go to, just go for it. Someone that you resonate with, someone that seems authentic, just walk the path that is relevant to you, that are in a position where you're like, yeah, I aspire to something like that uh, and allow that help in. Trust. You know, trust in life. Trust in the universe. I had a ceremony the other night uh, with a guy here and a big thing had come out of it just with such poignancy with trust and it can be such simple things it can make such a permanent and deep change within our being just to integrate that actual inner knowing of like trust trust in life trust in the process here for a mm. reason and, you know, and, and i've learned it so much in my life like i've there's so much more we could cover i know we've got out of time but like yeah 2021 i nearly died out of complete physical mental spiritual breakdown i was suicidal for a month you know that's only with 2024 the magnificence and splendor i'm experiencing my life after that rebirth of going into the ashes and coming out of it it's so like even with that and with the levels that i know you've gone to with where you were at with being agoraphobic and depressed and everything the, the power that that gives us is that like we tasted hell We've tasted such rock bottom, bottom of the barrel lows that then if someone comes to me and like, bro, I'm suicidal, or, bro, I'm just having the worst time, I'm like, it's okay. That's fine. Like, it's actually a great place to be at because you can rebuild from there, from the very bottom. So, yeah, everything is possible to expand out of the place where anyone finds himself if they're willing to trust and believe and to show up for it. You come out. Fred is wanting to get in touch with you. Let's make it easy for him. So um, people who have listened to this, right, there's a certain subset of the population who know I'm ready now. Yeah, let's just take it forward. How can they reach out to you? Give your social medias, email, website, all that. I'll link everything down below. Yeah. So if you can uh, give that invitation to Fred and let us know what they need yeah. to do. The simplest way is just go to my personal Instagram, Danny Saggers. One word, D A N N Y S A W G E R S. Oh, yes. Slide into my DMs and we can talk and take it from there. Like I say, I've got the ceremonial work that I do, the coaching, the retreats. We've got the Ibiza one coming up for men at the end of the year, going to be organizing the first Peru retreat for early next year. And yeah, there's so much magic coming. It's yeah, it's so exciting, and I just love working with people and helping them to to come into that sovereignty, that like connect with that inner guru, that inner shaman, start like molding reality with their intention, with their power. I love it. It's the best. What people help me do, and it's now what I'm helping people do. Love it. Oh, and just to remind you, if you want it, I'll do a wrap for you at the end of the show. <laughs> if you want it, let's do it. I'm going to drop all the information that Danny shared with you there. Um, reach out to him on Instagram. You know, I'll be more than happy to help. Um, I think it's important if people have things they want to address in the inner world, but they don't leave it too late because, frankly speaking, you don't have to suffer. You don't, you don't have to not have the life that you desire. Don't go through that. It's unnecessary. The help is there, yeah. So I would encourage people to reach out to Danny and um, see what see what works for you. Bit of coaching, coming to the retreats, you're going to be better off for it, and you're going to just achieve a lot more because of it. Um, so we're going to close this one up, Danny. If there's anything you want to contribute, share. The floor is yours. Just as you said, you know, me and you are living proof that you can come from the lowest lows to the highest highs that we're still elevating into even higher, you know, experiential life. 
So yeah, never give up. Never give up. And yeah, if if we're gonna close it, you wanna hear yeah. one of my raps? Let's do it. <clears throat> As I said, I grew up MCing to garage and grime. I was very good, but also very egotistical and rubbish. <laughs> you know. So when I drank ayahuasca, it opened up different ideas of what I could use my wordsmithery to present to people for awakening. So if you really listen to the words, they have a lot to teach you and me. When I hear them back, they reawaken me to certain universal truths. Okay. And my rap name is Spiral. And in a medicine ceremony at one point, it said to me, you chose that name because you knew everything's a spiral. That as all of existence is a spiral to a field. <laughs> so I've got a one track mind. I rap about medicine and turn on your inner lights like Thomas Edison. It's so relevant. The current interest is evident. Give the MT to the president. Politics ain't me, that's evident. Tell my demographic, it's irrelevant. We're more concerned with cosmic development, like how do we evolve from atoms and elements? Philosophical thinkers, medicine drinkers, embracing the higher intelligence. Want evidence? Visit megalithic sites, ancients left clues in the sediment. Crop circles finding their form in a field of corn and bringers of the dawn will keep you informed of current Pleiadian messages. Disclosure is eminent. We're Reiki masters, gods operators. We can move energy and heal with theta. I send Chongu Ray straight into the crown chakra for you to feel later. Manifesting sacred plans. I've been blessed with these healing hands. And as above, so below, because I can see the world in a grain of sand. These synchronicities run through me like electricity. And every day I pick up my phone, it's 11 11. I'm like, are you kidding me? We're part of the great mystery. I'm like, how did us humans come to be? Well, do you believe that Adam and Eve just kissed and the rest is history? So, what's the missing link? Let's just stop and think. Maybe it's the cosmic rays upgrades to our DNA as we connect and sync to spirit, infinite, play a part in it, information overload, no limit to the oneness, create of energy so we can manifest these lives of abundance. And this life's a trip. So when I pull back the layers, I say my prayers and give thanks to God for this, because we can live a life of eternal bliss from the singularity into a reality of duality, getting lost from the light, these spirit guides that walk by my side as I navigate through my soul's dark night. Life is a trip. Life is bliss. Life is a bitch. Life can switch. Life will enrich our souls with the knowledge that we came to the earth for assistance with another. Truth seeker, spitting out lyrics and then Eureka, I'm waking people up through the speaker. I take pure inspiration from the yoga sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, the human race. No such thing as time and space, future or past. See the universe in a blade of grass. You can never say that your life's too fast. You're eternal. The infinite whirlpool, energy tour, a spiral circle, a cosmic cycle where people are born and die, get recycled. Now that's what I call the greatest gift. Let's wake up to our true nature, the paradigm shift as the darkness lifts, procession of the equinox into the age of Aquarius. Yeah, the cosmic joke is hilarious. Got people from different areas. Think because they call one that's a different name or the others are wrong and nefarious. And I'm a firm believer. We're all dreamers. Up in a dance with Shakti and Shiva. I cut karmic calls in a cosmic cleaver, threading this life as a weaver. Are we all or nothing or neither? We're both at the same time manifestations with a zodiac sign that will walk to the earth so our spirit can shine. So draw the line. Your ancestors, you hold hate in your heart, it will fester. Heal your relationship to the one, the rip will go fuck like mine and Esther's did. We're all one. And the illusion of separation, that's nonsense. We're the ones we've been waiting for. And so we can find peace in the one true conscience. How Beautiful. Danny, thank you for sharing your personality, your knowledge, your creativity, your energy, your light wisdom just coming here and being real raw and authentic man is greatly appreciated yeah so appreciate you sincerely thanks ravi yeah. appreciate you too thank you for the invite really enjoyed it this was an incredible episode i loved it i really did man and uh, we're gonna speak more we're gonna talk more soon all right homie awesome brother i'm gonna wrap this one up